for her. I got my cheat sheet back. You got your notes. All is well, right? All right. Acts chapter number 20. And we're going to actually start around verse number 7. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. We're coming up on actually close to a year in the book of Acts, if you can, if you can believe that. And we're going verse by verse, of course, and uh, Acts chapter 20 is, as I always say, one of my favorites. Last week, I gave you the opportunity to go to, go to sleep um, if you needed a nap. This week will not be a good time for that because there's actually a guy that goes to sleep during the sermon and it just won't be a good time for it. So, And upon the first day of the week, verse 7, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. He continued his speech until midnight. Who's in? Raise your hand. Midnight preaching? Okay, me and Ed and Chloe. So, and there were many lights in the upper chamber when they gathered together, and there sat in window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen asleep, fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching... I love the Bible. He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, he kept preaching even after the guy had fell, even till the break of day so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted call this this morning he is alive he's alive let's pray father once again your people your word your house and no one's here to hear from ryan and i'm thankful for that i pray lord as your word goes out that it will do what only it can accomplish father that it'll actually change us from the inside out lord we're certainly in a dark culture we're trying to be lights among a lot of dark. I thank you, Lord, for the power of the gospel to raise us up from the dead. We're not simply blind men. We were dead men who had been made alive. And I thank you for that. I pray as your word goes out that it'll be received with it'll go out with power and it will truly do what it's called us sent out to do and not return void. We love you, we thank you, and above all things we trust you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. I don't know if you've ever heard of preacher regret, but I sure have enough of it. Preacher regret is being called to preach at the age of 16 and actually getting up and standing before people and preaching sermons that are somewhere out there on cassette tape for the most part. I was talking to a guy the other day, a young preacher, and he said, man, he said, back in the 90s when you, when you preached a sermon and kind of tanked or blew it, no one knew about it but the 25, 30 people that heard it. He said, now all my sermons are going out on Facebook for the world to see. As a matter of fact, now if you're looking for a church, you can just go on there. If you don't like a sermon that you're listening to, you don't have to scroll very far at all to find another one, right? It's like a buffet of what do I like about this one and this one and this one. I was going through last, last night, I was actually talking to Isaac and Faith via FaceTime, and I was telling them I always practice my sermon on them, and they're not as into it as I am at all. I always practice it via FaceTime, like, guys, guess what I'm talking about tomorrow? I'm talking about Eutychus. And I said, tell me about Eutychus. And Faith said, who's Eutychus? I said, who was your youth pastor, by the way? Because I was actually Faith's youth pastor. And I said, Faith, I preached this to you when you were a teenager. I preached this section of scripture. And she said, in the way that only she can, well, I don't remember it. So I thought, well, there's my impact that I made on the child, on the youth. So <laughs> it's kind of like my middle school boys now. I'm like, they're probably going to say, I don't remember that. But when I look back at this, I actually preached on Eutychus a long time ago, and I did what, I would, what preachers normally do with my man Eutychus. I blamed him. I yelled at him. I actually blindfolded myself. That's what I did, because I have been, ever since I was 16, I've always been into visuals and object lessons, and I'm no different than that now. I thought I would grow up. My apologies to you as the church. But I've always thought, if I can set myself in the scripture, if I can set myself in the scene, if I'm going to preach on somebody who is Bartimaeus, who's blind, I want to feel like what it's like to not be able to to see. And with Eutychus, I thought, well, I'll, I'll actually go at him and say, the dangers of falling asleep. And that's the problem with you kids today. You kids are blindfolded. You kids are asleep. And the world is moving past you. And can't you see what's going on? 
Can't you see all the dangers going on around you? And I was up there preaching. I was preaching this to a room full of teenagers. And I'll never, I remember, I called it living on the ledge is what I called it. Living on the ledge. Living on the ledge. Some of you got the reference. Some of you don't. But it's probably good if you didn't. So living on the ledge was actually, by the way, you are a wonderful looking crowd today. The, the living on the ledge was a sermon that I preached. And I preached to the teenagers. I said, listen, the dangers of falling asleep. Are you going to listen to this sermon? Because Eutychus didn't listen to his sermon. And you know what happened to him? Here's the danger of not listening when the word of God is being preached, when the man of God is in the pulpit. You pay attention. Anybody still here? Just checking. You know the danger of living your life and not listening? Do you understand the danger? And somewhere between then and a few weeks ago, I actually came to the thought, who would stay awake during a 12-hour sermon? Who would? I'm asking you seriously. Who, no, no, I'm not asking you to answer, but I'm asking you who would be asked to, to do that. Well, you, I could jump in and say, but guys, this isn't Ryan Massey preaching. This is the greatest preacher of all time. You, if you ranked all preachers of all time, if you had a preacher draft of all time and you took Jesus out of it, that's not fair. He's God with ten fingers and ten toes. But if you were to say, rank for me the greatest preachers who have ever lived, all of us with the first pick would take Paul. All of us would take him. So when I was preaching that, and when I was preaching that back day, and I actually found the notes on some of this, by the way, my notes used to be, I have notes written on napkins. I have notes written on little, little slips of paper. Uh, now I have page after page after page, and some of you are glad for it, and some of you are not glad for it. But believe me, I've come a long way in knowing what I should say and what I shouldn't say. But I think no wonder Faith didn't remember that. She probably blocked it out of her mind for her own mental state. You need to wake up. Or is he more than a blind guy? Who needs to see? Is he actually a dead guy who needs to breathe? And there's a major difference. In a blind guy who just needs to see, and a dead guy who actually needs to be brought to life. There's far more to Eutychus than the 30-year-old Ryan Massey actually seen. And as we look at this, as we go into this, I want you to see that we're talking about not a long-winded preacher and some teenager somewhere sitting in a, on a window seat that just can't follow the points. What we're going to see is a much deeper picture because what we see in verse number, what we see first of all in these verses is the first day of the week and a really cool picture of why the church was gathering. They are coming together because Sunday was resurrection day on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, which is really cool because they're not just breaking bread to eat, they're breaking bread for communion. They are coming together for preaching and communion and all these years later, guess what we're doing today? We're coming together for preaching and communion. You see, we're still doing what they instructed us to do. What they're doing is the Lord's Supper and preaching. The Lord commanded them to partake of communion, and when they heavily, and they heavily emphasized the teaching and preaching of Scripture, and Paul for sure heavily emphasized, it, emphasized, emphasized preaching and teaching, because my man was preaching 12-hour sermons. So the Lord's Supper was what this was, was, was a time to come together. And when you look at this, you would say, uh, if you look at this, you'd say the, the amount of time that we budget in a worship service, we're more heavily emphasizing the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. I love this church for several reasons, but one of the main reasons I love this church is the centrality of the Word of God. We are here to hear what God has to say. We love singing, we love fellowshipping, we love getting together. But this church is steered by this pulpit, not this man. This church, if it had a steering wheel, it would be this pulpit. Amen? It would go and guide it from here, from here. Not necessarily, I'm in charge. No, no, far higher than me. This word, this God, he's in charge. And so when we come together, we emphasize what they emphasize, the breaking of bread and the preaching and teaching of the word. 
I have a friend that told me their church is growing and they're exploding. He said, man, you got to go online and watch my church. you got to watch it. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go. Because I, you don't have to ask me twice to watch church. I love church. I love preaching. I'm a preaching geek. I'll listen to it as often as I can. And so I watched it. I'm going to go in here because their church is it's, it's, it's busting at the seams. I watched it. I started from the beginning because I wanted to watch their whole service. 50 minutes. 50 minutes of singing. 50. 15 minutes of preaching. 50 minutes of singing, which I love, and it was great. But that's not going to get you through when the doctor says it's cancer. That's not going to be enough to hold on to when the family blows up. That's not going to be enough. And I'm for all of these things. But what we find in verse number 7 is the breakdown of how we budget the service. And how we budget the service is this. I have nothing greater to say to you than what the Lord has to say to you. So while singing and all those things are important and all the things, we budget the time to say, even with King's kids, we budget the time to say the priority here is the teaching of the word of God. So when we look at this, that's the Lord's Supper and preaching. So Eutychus, I love this, I asked Faith this, she didn't know. I asked Isaac, he wasn't in the picture, so I think he Googled it because he got it right. Uh, Eutychus' name means fortunate. That's what it means. It means fortunate. So back in this day, what's happening is if you can use your imagination, let's recreate this scene in our minds. They have chosen to meet in the upper room. They're on the third floor of a house. They've chosen to gather. And you can only imagine, but there are enough examples throughout the rest of the New Testament of houses that they were gathered in what was probably a fairly large house with enough room for people to come together. They opened the windows. And there's a city over there. If you were able to find this city, it would be the northwest coastal corner of modern-day Turkey. So here they are on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's about springtime. We know that. A couple of verses before in chapter 20, we see they just celebrated Passover. And they were to understand that the climate in that day, it's a spring day. It would be normal to dip down into the 40s or 50s at night. It's great sleeping weather. We get the scene. Imagine you're there. They're gathered together in the upper room. They open the windows. There's a draft of cool air coming through. Back in my days in that great city of Waterloo, Ohio, I was telling my kids, we didn't have air conditioning. Now imagine this, young people. There was no air conditioning. If I thought right now that my air conditioner was going out, I would be calling, I would stop the sermon and say, I would call a technician. Wouldn't you? We never had it. I opened my window, put a fan in that, and that's some sleeping there. You kids don't know me. I lived a hard life. So, so I, put it in, I put it in there, and the, the, the cold night air would come through. And so you can imagine him sitting there, and I try to think through best what Paul might have sounded like. But I can't wait to meet Paul because I want to know if he was loud, if he was bold, if he was shouting. I tend to think Paul, more an intellectual, was probably more of a kind of a calm. Now Peter, Peter stood up on a stump, preached a few sentences, and 3,000 people got saved. Paul stood before Mars Hill and said, you guys got a lot of statues. And I'm noticing you have a lot of statues, and I notice one to an unknown God. Well, I want to talk to you about that one. So Paul preaching for 12 hours might not have been that powerful speech that you, would have, that you would have expected. So Paul was not someone you would have been drawn to as a charismatic leader. So Eutychus is there in the window. Paul is preaching. No doubt he's sinking into the warmth of lamps around him. He falls to sleep. How dare he fall asleep during the preaching of the word? Yeah, he fell asleep. And here's what a youth pastor, Ryan Massey, would never admit to you. He was there. I think we need to give people credit for showing up more. Do you know in this culture how difficult it is just to show up? It is difficult to show up. Culture is setting a standard for us as parents, that is impossible to manage. We are taxi services for kids who don't play sports. They have jobs, basically. They're part of a team that demands things of them 
that we had no demand on us for. Eutychus is tired, Eutychus is asleep, but Eutychus is present. And many people will say to me, well, Ryan, I, I'm going to come to church, but I don't know if I can, I might even fall asleep. I'd rather you fall asleep here than be awake out there. I would. Now, if it happens over and over again, I'm somewhat offended. But if it happens one or two times, you would, it might be a problem between us. But listen, if you're here, Eutychus is here. And I never would have said that when I was younger. I never would have said that when I, I would have never stood before in my independent, fundamental, missionary Baptist days. I never would have stand up, stood up and said, you know, the kid at least is in the room. And I want to say that to young people. You're in the room. And I'm not so proud that I have to have you. Bible in hand, notebook, I can't wait to hear the next point. That's not usually the teenage way. But let me say this to you as well. Time in church is never wasted time. Sermons are never wasted. Sermons are like medicine. Some of it you take, and you're like, wow, I felt that. I feel the, I, that makes me feel good. Some of it you take, you're going to have to take for a long time to get anything out of it, right? Eutychus' name means fortunate, and how great that the Lord had him name that, because my man is going to show us just how fortunate it is. This is ironic because he's actually going to fall out of this window and be resurrected. But I want you to pay attention to Eutychus. Rather than him falling asleep, here's what's noteworthy. He definitely becomes the center of attention, so when we meet him in heaven one day, we're going to be like, hey, you're awake. So it's going to be like, definitely, he <laughs> my jokes are just not hitting today. They're just not. He finally becomes, but what I want you to see is, is that even though he's asleep, he showed up. Have you ever been in a moment in your spiritual journey where you were so defeated, so discouraged, you were falling asleep in the rhythm of the routine of whatever may be pressing in your life, you were weary and all you could do is just show up? Have you ever been so beat down by the enemy, by the world, and even by your own self that you all you could do is just get there? I know people like that. And I look at a person like that in the mirror. I know what it's like to say, you know what, today I'm just going to show up. My boss, God bless her heart, at Lily's place, when I went through the darkest time of my life, she said, Ryan, I don't care if you come and lay under your desk. Just show up. You know there are people that battle with severe depression. Do you know what a victory it is for them, for their feet to hit the floor and show up? It is a great victory, maybe even for someone sitting under the sound of my voice today, that they put clothes on and got out of the house. And if we really knew the story, we would say, God bless you, to God be the glory, great things he's doing in your life. It is a big deal to show up. So what we find here is he, he's trying to be present, he's trying to be engaged, he's trying to be strong, but dude won't stop preaching. What do you do? You're like, Ryan, I'm actually living this right now. What are you doing? No, I'm timing this. It's not going to be 12 hours, I promise. But what we find here is four lessons we can learn that I never caught all those, time, all those years ago when I preached on Eutychus. And if you're taking note, and if you're young, you probably aren't, but that's okay. But if you're taking note, number one, God will use your weakness. God will use your weakness to others to, show, to point others to his power. I missed the word point. God will use your weakness to point others to his power. Now I think this may be where we could see the meat or the heart of this text. It's an opportunity for us to be reminded that our weakness is, can point to God's power. For Eutychus, it was simple weakness of being able to stay awake and be present. We're going to see this as the story unfolds that God uses this fortunate situation to point others to his power. But what about your own life? It may be something seemingly more significant than just weakness or being able to stay awake. What are some weaknesses or trials in your life? What are struggles in your life, in my life, that you really wish you could have victory over, but you continue to stumble and fail? God will use your weakness to point others to his power. It was Paul who said, I take pleasure in my infirmities. In reproaches and persecutions, Paul says, good for me. In distresses for Christ's sake. Why, Paul? Why is it a good thing for you to suffer? 
Why is it a good thing for you to have persecution? Why is it a good thing for you to be under pressure? Because Paul says, when I'm weak, that's when people look at him. In your darkest times, in the deep struggles of your life that nobody knows about but you and God, those are the things that if they do not go away, they must go to work for his glory. If you have a struggle that will not go away, it must go to work. And that's what Paul is saying. My weakness, your weakness, whatever your weakness may be, is an opportunity to point others to the power of God in your life. My strength is made perfect in weakness. But what the enemy loves to do is take your weakness and magnify them with the flashlight of your soul and use that as an opportunity to tell you you're not good enough. And any time the enemy tells me I'm not good enough, I agree with him. Because it has nothing to do with my goodness. It is Christ who is good. And I point him to Christ. When the enemy points me to me, I point him to Christ. And that's what you have to do. You'll never make it. You'll never matter. You'll never amount to anything. What you did will never be forgiven. If you do matter, if, if, if only people knew you, if people knew the real you, and the enemy loves to point those things back at you. He reminds you of your past. You remind him of his future. He will be cast into the lake of fire. When I look to him, I see him, I fix my eyes on him, that's what I do. It's in my weakness that God is glorified. And that's what we have to understand. That what we learn from Eutychus, most of, uh, first of all, is that God will use that weakness to point people to Christ. It is the story, remember they, they brought the, story, the, the things, to the little loaves and fish to Jesus. And Jesus says, bring them to me. It was before that situation that the disciples came to him and said, all these people are hungry. And they say a fascinating prayer. They tell Jesus, send them away that these might eat. You know, if Jesus would have answered the prayer of the disciples that day on that mountainside, we never would have seen the miracle. There are many people that are saying in their weakness, send it away, Lord, please take this away. What you don't understand is, is that your mess is what qualifies you for a miracle. All you need to get in line for a miracle is a mess. Anybody ever had a mess? You qualify for a miracle. So don't send them away. Give it to Jesus and watch what he does to it. So we learn from Eutychus, as Eutychus is falling asleep, falling into deep sleep, verse number 9, after Paul was long sleeping, sunk down with sleep, fell upon the third loft and was taken up dead. We also learn this, point number 2, God turns tragedy into joy. Here in this text, the hills of the Passover, we read the first few verses and what we find is what's on everybody's mind. I can't help but think that because of this on the hills of the Passover, Paul's knowing what everybody was thinking about and what they're thinking about is resurrection. And God gives Paul the greatest object lesson of all time for a resurrection sermon. He gives him a dead guy. How cool is God? You're like, this is weird, Ryan. No, it's the Bible. The purpose of the scene is not to warn us against the dangers of falling asleep. It's a reminder of the gospel's power to give life. The purpose of this narrative is to show us that God makes dead people alive. This is a striking coincidence of life in the midst of death. The moment we must have been a powerful reminder for the disciples that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus and the widow's son, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus in John chapter number 11. The voice of Peter in Acts chapter number 9. The Old Testament, we see the power that God uses through Elijah and Elisha. Striking similarities here that God turns tragedy into joy. Watch this. Number three, God doesn't make bad people good. God makes dead people alive. And the point, of course, if you look at this, watch what it says in verse number 9. Being fallen asleep, as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down in the third loft and was taken up dead. And I want you to underline something in your Bible. Four words that I love that a young Ryan Massey certainly missed, and here it is. Now remember, Eutychus is not just sleeping. Eutychus is dead, right? Verse number 10, and Paul went. I wonder who ever went down for dead people. In you, hath he quickened, made alive. Who were not sick. Who were not just bad people who needed to 
change your ways. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. There is no goodness, as we will find this, there is no amount of goodness, no amount of giving, no amount of volunteerism, no amount of morality that could bring me out of a dead state. Paul going down is a picture of our Lord and Savior stepping down out of the portals of heaven and coming into his own while his own received him not. Paul went down. Why? Because Eutychus could not go up. And you know what we're trying to do? We're just looking at the lost world and saying, why don't they see it? I don't understand why they just don't see what they're doing that's wrong. I don't understand why they just don't straighten up. I don't understand why they just don't hashtag a better me. I don't understand why. Why can't you see? And you sit across from people with your Bible in your lap and you say, can you see can you see what you're doing? I'm telling you, I watch slow-moving car accidents with lives all week long. And I'm telling you, I'll sit across from people, do you know the decisions you're making, the ripple effect of these decisions? And they're just like, no, I don't see it. And I'm like, yeah, you don't. Because you're more than blind. And forgive me, this is Bible. Apart from Christ, you're dead. And even if you could see for a moment, you'd blindfold yourself again. Because we've never asked a dead man to do one thing. A dead man has no desire to do anything. A dead man has no calendar. A dead man has nothing he can do. We won't expect anything of him, and we should stop expecting anything spiritual of dead people. Amen to that? We should stop expecting we got exactly what we got. When we have a godless society, it equals godlessness. And we should not be surprised. When you, have, when you, when, when, where, where you and I have to be very guarded is our desire to engage culture and our desire to make a difference. It is really easy for us to only talk about morality. You guys need to straighten up. That's what you need. You need to vote right. You need to act right. It's great to be moral, but my morality should flow from an overflow of the evidence of the gospel in my life. Paul said, when I, even when I do good, evil's present with me. Paul said, there's nothing even in the good stuff I do that's actually me. I can't change me. It's a heartfelt change motivated, motivated and moved by Jesus, not just out of a desire to be good, out of a desire to be God's. Right? It's not that I'm just going to do better. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just blind. You know what? Just pray for my kids because they, they're just blind. Listen, it's not that they're just blind and they need to see. It's that they're dead and they need to breathe. And only God can bring that breath. So today we come into His presence. We choose to come into His presence with, with praise. That's what we do. And so Paul goes down, falls on him, embracing him, and said, trouble not yourselves. Trouble not yourselves and fell on him. And watch what happens as we see this, the gospel. We see what, what they have is this resurrection, and Paul gets back to preaching. Verse number 11, when he therefore was come down and had broken bread and eaten, this is Paul, and talked a long time, a long, long while, even to the break of day. Guy goes down, raises the kid from the dead. You know what? I wasn't done with my point. How important does Paul think preaching is? The gospel is urgent. Why does Paul get back to preaching? Three reasons. Heaven awaits, Revelation 22.20. Hell is real, Revelation 22.15. And harvest is ready, John 4.35. Heaven awaits, this is heaven awaiting, eternity is real. Eternity is long. Jesus is coming back. Hell is real. 
This is not some fictitious story made up. This is a real place of torment and eternal separation from God. And I will always preach this because the Bible says it. If that offends you, I'm, you're not offended by me. You're offended by the word of God. There's a real place called heaven and there's a real place called hell. And real people are going to both. And harvest is ready. Heaven awaits. Hell is real. Harvest is ready. Jesus says, but you're saying four months until harvest, but I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white unto harvest. That's why Paul keeps preaching. But I want you to watch in closing as we get ready to land this thing. Watch what happens. After a 12-hour sermon from the greatest preacher ever lived, watch how they leave the room. Verse number 11, when they therefore was come up again and broken bread and eaten and talked for a long while, even the break of day, so he departed. So Paul left. I don't know if they gave him an offering. They probably were glad to see him go. But watch in verse number 12. And they brought together the young man. They brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. You're like, well, probably not. They bring the young man in. They bring him in. They're like, hey, you just fell out of the window and now you're walking around. There's nothing more powerful than a changed life. You say, Ryan, my testimony isn't that. It's not that big. I mean, I, I just, all I did was like I was dead and now I'm alive. Listen, your testimony has power. You ever see anybody out and they're like, you're different, right? It's talking, with Mitch, we're talking about back in the day. My fourth grade teacher once came to see me, came to hear me preach. It was several years ago. I said, so good to see you. She said, Ryan, I came here because I didn't believe you were actually doing this. That's why she came. She was like, i got to prove that. i got to see this for myself. And so your, the power of bringing this guy in and saying, hey, here, you imagine Lazarus the next day showing up at the camel races or whatever he's going to? Can you imagine Lazarus? Like, man, that was, can we talk about Lazarus here for a uh, No, so what did they, they left not a little comforted. They didn't leave hashtag blessed. They didn't say every day is a Friday. They left, and the Bible says they're not a little comforted. Now, what's that mean? In the Greek, write this down. It means they left with urgency. It means they left with urgency. Not a little comforted means they're looking at a guy who was, alive, who was dead, and now he's alive, and there's urgency now. They had just witnessed a dead man come to life, and hear me, they could not sit still. And I wonder who else knows about a dead man who's come to life. When we look at this, they left with an urgency. Yeah, there's stuff going on in culture. There's a lot going on around us. But let me tell you about a man named Jesus. I mean, let's be honest. Had you just fallen out a third-story window, died and been raised back to life, some of us would be like, you know what, I'm not feeling that well. I mean, I know I'm alive, but I kind of got a headache. Right? He just went back in church and kept learning. Guy's still a king's kid. Right? God forbid, my, my kids, my middle school boys are trying to climb out the window sometimes. Not Hebrews 12, please. Right, you know what I mean? This kid fell out of the window, dies, is raised again, goes back and listens to more preaching. Not because he's morally in and of himself desires that, because he didn't before. He fell asleep. He's there because he's been brought to life. It is the same reason I'm here, and it's the same reason I would imagine you're here. You're here because a dead man came to life. That's why you can walk out of here with power. You can walk out of here with joy. You can walk out of here knowing that I once was not just blind, but now I see I once was dead and now I'm alive. They were urged. They were pushed. What they heard had changed them. You're changed by a resurrection, and you and I should be as well. So I apologize to Elmwood Youth Group in the year of our Lord, 20-whatever that was. I should have told you you can't see, but I should have went a step further and told you that your problem wasn't your sight. Your problem was your breath. Only God can change your life. And when he does it, he does it for good. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed.
Well, it wasn't 12 hours. It was 35 minutes to be exact if you're taking notes. But we love the word of God here. You know, maybe you're here today and maybe right now you're here and maybe you're struggling with a weakness. I want you to know that's the thing that might point people to Christ in your life. And you're here and you say, Ryan, I'm a Christian. No one looking around you to say, but Ryan, by left of, left of the hand, pray for me. There's something I struggle with. There's something I, I'm just, nobody knows about but me and God, but I just need your prayers. Anyone like that? Just left lifted hand. God bless you. I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, if it doesn't go away, God bless you. If it doesn't go away, it's got to go to work. If God doesn't change it, it's got to change you and then change others, okay? So don't be too quick to say, send it away. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you so much, for, Lord, for the freedom to preach in this place. God, of all the pulpits in all the world, Lord, there is so much freedom here, and I am so grateful for that. I pray, Lord, that you'll just help me, Lord, as I, even in my own heart, Sometimes we just try to make ourselves better, just start doing it right. Father, help us to be reminded that we could not, on our own, ever do anything pleasing to a thrice holy God. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us. I pray for the hands that were raised for whatever the reason. There are people here that are fighting battles that none of us know how serious they are. I pray, Lord, that we would never make light of that, but we would point them to you. For you are the one who brings about true change. I pray you'd help us, Lord. Help us to always be mindful that it's for your glory that we do everything we do. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said.